Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hatfield Congregational. And we are going to start right at 10 o'clock so that we uh, can get over to our old-fashioned Christmas on time. So the flowers today are still being offered from the last Sunday. They're still beautiful by Maureen Burris. And they are offered in, mother, in, her, in memory of her mother, Frances Smith. And chat and coffee is expanded today. We are going to have our old-fashioned Christmas potluck supper. Uh, so I do hope that all of you will try to stay afterwards. Um, and we'll have a nice old-fashioned Christmas out in the back. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards, uh, Linda may make an appearance, but I don't think she's staying for church. She's unable to today for family obligations, but you know how to contact Linda. Uh, envelopes are available at the back of the church, uh, these nice purple ones. This is for the Christmas fund of the UCC, and uh, our donations to this, the church makes a $100 donation, but if you'd like to make individual donations, uh, this helps the church to support uh, clergy in need uh, upon the retirement, upon medical emergency, etc. So if you'd like to make your own donation for that, the envelopes are at the back of the church. Um, I already mentioned the potluck supper, the old-fashioned Christmas. Um, we also, are we all set? Where's Carolyn? Is Carolyn here? Uh, no, um, <laughs> no, uh, with the giving tree. Oh, there she is in the back. <laughs> Carolyn, are we all set with the giving tree? Are we all, Carol, are we all set? I'm sorry, not Carol. Carol, are we all set with the giving tree? I'm yeah. still waiting for something more to be returned. I've gotten several already today and I haven't been able to tally it up. But if anybody didn't bring it today and they have them this week, I need them to deliver to my house by Thursday. Okay, so either here today or to your house by Thursday right, for and delivery. I'm not going to leave it by my back door. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you, Carol. Um, the Christmas flowers, June is not able to be with us this morning, but Marty is taking any donations for Christmas flowers. And uh, if you know that you, you donate the plant itself, so after our Christmas Eve service, you're allowed to take that poinsettia home with you, or you can talk to June, and June will make sure that it gets to a uh, person in need. Uh, so see June, or today see Marty, about Christmas flowers. Also, if interested, there is a tuba Christmas at the United Church of Berniston starting this afternoon at 1.30. Uh, it's an awful lot of fun. They have little clips of that on, on their YouTube, and it's a tuba Christmas. And I think, from what I've seen, there must be about 20 tubas all being played in different Christmas carols. So if you want to take a drive up to Berniston, tuba Christmas is at 1.30. Uh, today, or tomorrow, the food bank, there's a volunteer opportunity from 1 to 4. Uh, we go down there and we try to help with that project under Linda's supervision. Also, the trustees will meet on Wednesday at 7. And on Saturday, there's a bunch of us from the church going to see a Christmas carol at the Hanover Theater in Worcester. And looking forward to that. Also, now, Carolyn, do you want to say anything about the uh, SOS, um, the uh, Save Our... Christmas, but uh, Maddox is a 14-year-old boy with terminal cancer, and all he's asked for is that uh, he receives some Christmas cards. And so if you can send him some Christmas cards, uh, Mary did have the mailing addresses, and I imagine she may still this week as well. So we'll talk to her afterwards. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Yes. Just a reminder for anyone that needs to get a report in for the annual record. Whenever you have that ready, email it to either to me or to Mark Jalot. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. If anyone uh, sold anything else from the Christmas craft fair uh, after Sunday, they need to give me the money so I can get to the bank. Okay. And I think also at our old fashioned Christmas, uh, some of that nice stuff that Glenda made is uh, that Glenda made is all on that table and that's still open for sale. So if you would like to uh, purchase any of those nice pieces of furniture, uh, please do so at the old fashioned Christmas. Yes. Thank 
Thank you. Do you want to mention our own Jeff Bolts right there from our choir? There is a holiday concert, and that will be taking place this coming Saturday and Sunday, both at 4 p.m. at the East Hampton Congregational Church. And if you'd like advanced tickets, you can see Jeff. Um, and there's also tickets at the door. So if you'd like to go see Snow, 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 question mark, a holiday concert, uh, please see Jeff who will be a part of that, that group. So seeing no other announcements, all right. I talked to Anthony that he's going to have to help me here. Our prelude in French is evening, and well, just go ahead, Anthony. I don't know the rest of it. Go ahead, Anthony. It's the soir by Louis Vianney. That's why Anthony had to do it. Yeah. Oh, and I should also mention our violist, 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 violist. Okay. Help me again with the name. Brianna Resnick. Brianna Resnick is our violist.
evening, very peaceful, which sets us right in the mood for the lighting of our Advent wreath. Wait. No, I think we do this and then we do it, though. My one, I never want to minister. <laughs> hey, good, I've got one for a change. <laughs> All right, so this week we are lighting the second candle of the Advent wreath, and that would be the candle of peace. We gather around the Advent wreath today knowing that we are not perfect, that we all make mistakes. Only Jesus followed God perfectly. Jesus, Jesus not only show, shows us, but he helps us to live as God wants us to live. Jesus gives us peace. A reading from Isaiah. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace, for the throne of David hath his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of light of God into the world. With the coming of this light, is, there is peace, for Christ is called Prince of Peace. Christ's name is Emmanuel, God with us. The presence of Christ with us gives us peace every day. Eternal God, we thank you that through all the years you have given us this chance for peace. Help us to seize these opportunities when violence, terrorism, and war are so much more easily glorified. Help us to find peace in our days. We pray that in this Advent season, we may show also your presence to the sick, the hungry, and the lonely, so that they too may find your peace. Amen. Church. 
Yesterday, uh, Sharon and I, we took a day off and went to uh, Boston to see our youngest daughter out there. And uh, so it was an early start, a full day with her, who was only in her early 20s, and we got home late. And then our second daughter came uh, home yesterday, too, so she came in through the door as soon as we were going to bed, came in and started talking to us. So all the cylinders are not really firing right now. Um, so I'm hoping that Leanne and, and you guys and all that kind of get me going, because I need a little shot of adrenaline here. So we're going to join now with our call to worship. Listen for a message from God. The way is prepared for Christ's coming. He comes to us with a promise of peace. Come with your joys and sorrows, laughter and tears. There is a place for you in the company of other seekers. We are partners in the gospel of Christ's peace. Claim anew this opportunity and responsibility to change the world. We are glad God is doing great things among us. We want to be part of it. And God's peace is set upon us. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us now raise our voices together in our unison prayer. How good it is to gather where the garments of sorrow and affliction can be removed we share time together in the house of God. Here, we are embraced by the peace of Jesus' promised Advent, and we are welcomed for who we are. The excitement of Advent restores us to our best selves, to people who cherish the peace and community that the Nativity promises. May our Advent preparations make a difference within and among us today, so that we can work for a better tomorrow. Amen. Now let us join in our gift of song, O Day of Peace That Dim Dimly Shines, Blue Hymnal number 711. <laughs>
May we now share with one another the gift of peace. So 
I just want you to remember this idea of that peace candle. We went from hope, and now we're talking about peace. And as soon as you talk about peace, we double the light of Advent. So let's try to work for peace. We're going to talk about that in the sermon, and we're going to try to talk about that a lot more, because without this, <laughs> um, there's going to be pretty bad times, okay? So peace is the, is the, is the best cho choice for our world. And so peace is a Christian message that we have to hammer home, not only in Advent, but always. So not only me, but somebody else too. Okay, guys, enjoy your Sunday school classes.
the next time we hear Silent Night will be on our Christmas Eve, 7 p.m. Uh, Christmas Eve service, and that we do by candlelight. I'm just throwing out a quick advertisement for that. So it is now time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And I'd like to uh, lead off with a, a special prayer for Eliza Harper. Um, died on her 26th birthday uh, from an overdose. And uh, she played all kinds of sports with my daughter. Um, and I heard that yesterday at the uh, wake, the, uh, the soccer team that she played on, they all sat still as one group. And they've been out of school for five or six years now. Um, they all sat together, and I, I think that was very meaningful. And her memorial service will be this afternoon at the Helen Hills Hills Chapel at Smith College. And uh, Sharon and I will be attending as with Beth. And uh, so I may be leaving a little bit early from the old-fashioned Christmas to get over there. I imagine there's going to be quite, uh, quite a line to even try to get in. Uh, but please keep Eliza Harper in your prayers and also uh, her family and her friends who are grieving terribly. Also, prayers at this time for Stephanie Cloutier as she fights MS is offered by her mother, Sandy Wildman. Uh, prayers for Sue Fabru as well. Prayers for Charlie Kellogg as he continues his recovery. Prayers for uh, Sue Gilman also, uh, who is uh, undergoing her treatments for cancer. Prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner, and it's so nice to see Denise Wagner right back there with us, able to be with us today. Nice to see you, Denise. Also, prayers for Muriel Kimovich, also recovering from a recent operation for her cancer. Prayers for Lynn Omasta as she is treated for her cancer. Prayers for the health of Jean Sheehan, right there with us today. Nice to see you, Jean. Wonderful to have you here today. Prayers for Johnny Benson as well. Very nice to see you, Johnny. Prayers for Sarah and Jimmy Pigeon and their unborn twin girls that all may uh, go well. And are there any other joys or concerns or celebrations? Carol. Uh, prayers for Ed Keith and his family and lost his grandfather. And that funeral was yesterday? Yes. Okay. Pray prayers for Ed Keith's grandfather. And yes, Carol. Prayers for my friend Ruth, who's had a series of medical crises and will be undergoing surgery at Mass General this Thursday. This Thursday. Okay. And I think Mary had a prayer for her son as well, correct? He, um, Mary's got, uh, yeah, there's, there's some prayers for uh, the health of Mary uh, McCarthy's son. So we'll keep uh, Mary McCarthy's son's uh, son in our prayer as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seeing no others. Uh, let us just now, in that same mood of like that silent night that was sung so beautifully, let us just gather in silence with one another around us, but so we can concentrate on the presence of God within us, and also to say to Jesus the things we would not say privately, and to listen for him. God of the prophets, open our imaginations so that we may better participate in these moments of revelation. So we may better trust in what you and only you can make possible. Open your word to our hearts and our minds. May your past revelations from the prophets and your continuing revelation through Jesus Christ among us here and now hold a fresh message that inspires us to be our better selves. Draw us closer to you. Help us to cherish your presence here and always in our lives. And may this relationship assure us that the prayers that we have offered, spoken and silently in our hearts, that they are important to you and that they are heard. Now let us join together in saying the prayer that Jesus gave us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What is a fitting offering to God when in Advent we prepare ourselves to receive the very gift of God himself in the coming birth of Jesus Christ? When we concentrate on the sense of wonder that surrounds us at this special time of the year, all because of the coming of Christ's child, 
as a child, and as we realize the amazing extent of God's concern for each and every person on the face of this good creation, and even creation itself, as he enters into our world, we can only respond with charity. What we place before God in his sanctuary is a small measure of our gratitude for all that God continuously gives to us. So let us now give our gifts to God, who has gifted us with his very self.
go, everybody. Hi. You probably could hear me even without the microphone. But Today's reading is from Malachi. I had to do a double take. Is Malachi in the Old Testament or New Testament? Malachi actually has the honor of being the last uh, chapter of the book in the Old Testament. Just thought I'd share that with you. And I go to the Bible classes. <laughs> Today I'm reading from Malachi 3, verses 1 through 4, if you'd like to follow along. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to this, his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And our gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapters 3, verses 1 through 6. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria and Traconitus, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went to all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. So John the Baptist is a central Advent figure, and I know you know that because that was December's newsletter article, and I know you all read that and then reread it and highlighted it and studied it, so I know that's already a given point. Now, for Christians, we hold that he fulfills the prophecy of Malachi that Amy just read for us this morning. And if you do have a chance, as she kind of highlighted, in your pew Bibles, if you go to, is it page like 779, just to make the point absolutely clear, on page 779 of the, uh, the pew Bibles, you have the last words of the prophets of the Old Testament. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and terrible day of the Lord. You turn the page. And if you didn't have this fancy science in the New Testament, the next thing you get is the story of the coming of Jesus. And in that story, Elijah is absolutely essential. The Old Testament closes with a prophecy of the coming of Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord. The New Testament opens with John the Baptist, preparing the way for the ministry of Christ. So John is that the messenger that we talked about. He is the one who prepared the way for the coming of Jesus on Christmas. And as Christians, we believe that John the Baptist somehow, miraculously, mysteriously, is John, is Elijah returned. So Elijah was the one swept away into heaven, according to the Old Testament tradition, in a fiery chariot. He is walking along. God sends a fiery chariot, fiery horses, and swoops up Elijah and takes him up into the sky. In other words, according to that tradition, Elijah does not technically die because both Jews and Christians, we do not believe in reincarnation, so we don't believe that Elijah died and came back. So instead we have this message of this chariot coming down and swooping Elijah away until his appointed time. 
So the hope was that Elijah would someday return from heaven and that he would come and prepare the way for the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. Nobody expected that he would come in a manger, but still he came to prepare the way for the Christ. So I was reading a magazine article about this young Jewish girl in Poland right as World War II was breaking out. And she reminisced because she had so many things to fear. She was in hiding. She didn't know what the future held. And so she reminisced in these terrible times about when she was even younger and that she would hope for the coming of Elijah. Then suddenly, she remembers from her holiday traditions when it was a lot safer, this Elijah would come with astounding and irrefutable power and no one would be able to stand up to this messenger of God come back from heaven. But, sadly, as the Soviets and the Nazis invaded, they divided Poland between them, this earlier hope seemed only like a childhood fantasy. And now as that now teenage older girl, she looked back on that and she just thought, you know, I'm in a land where they hate Jews and I am Jewish. It just seems so impossible that God could somehow intervene so dramatically. And her 1939 story is just like the story of John the Baptist. There is so much just kind of heaped up in holding these people down. How do you have hope when everything around you is just saying the opposite of hope? There's hopelessness. So Luke just with that same story in mind. Luke begins this story about John, not by talking about John, but by talking about all the powers that be at that time. He begins at the very top with the Roman emperor, Tiberius, a powerful man of the sword. He was conquered way up north by the Germanic tribes, and he was such a powerful military man that he became the, ru the ruler of the entire Roman Empire. Next is mentioned Pontius Pilate, and we know him because of the cross, but Pontius Pilate is another military man. He's the governor of occupied Palestine at that time. And then there are two of Herod's brothers. These, these are the pawns of the Romans. They, they don't really care about the people. They, 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 their only concern is that we don't take off the Romans so we can stay in power and gather our wealth and our luxury and all of that and all the perks of power. And then he finally mentions Annas and Caiaphas, the two high priests in the temple. But after he mentions all of these people of power, there's a strange line. Luke tells us that the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. What was John already doing out in the wilderness? John was a son of privilege. He was the firstborn son of a Jerusalem temple priest. He had all of the privileges waiting there for him. He had honor, he had prestige, he had a good life, he had God on his side, it would be said. But he's out in the wilderness. He should have been at the temple, but he's out in the wilderness. And this is before he has any calling from God. God didn't drive John out into the wilderness for some kind of a purpose, so he could therefore start baptizing, start preaching, and preparing the way for the Lord. John flees out there because he's so confused. All of these powers that be, they just seem so out of touch with what I think God wants me to do, but I don't know how to respond, and he runs away. He goes into the wilderness in desperation. John was already out there. He was looking for something. He knew he was not meant to stay in Jerusalem. He knew he was not meant to be a temple priest, so he must have been deeply troubled about all of these men of power and about the possibility that change just seemed absolutely impossible. It was a story, again, of hopelessness. The Romans had overrun most all of the entire known world. The temple that Herod had built was a magnificent, wondrous structure. Annas and Caiaphas stood at the very temple, at the pinnacle of that hierarchy in the temple, and John was being prepared to be a part of that as well. Just like that Jewish girl in 1939 Poland, the ways the world must have crushed his hopes, they must have crushed his spirit. There was no way that God's messenger could come and make a difference. It was a fantasy, it was a fairy tale. So in both that young girl's story and in John's story, it must have been a horrible burden to try to believe differently. The way things were seemed impossible to change, to overcome. The ways of the world seemed almost always to win in God's will. Maybe this promise of a messenger, it just seemed like a fairy tale. And that's completely understandable. 
that young Jewish girl writing in her diary, she was shot and killed by Nazi sh uh, soldiers who found her in hiding, simply took her out once they found her and shot her in the street. That was all the justice they needed. John the Baptist was beheaded on the orders of Herod, took his head right off because he dared to complain about you cannot marry that woman. But somehow, that girl's words and her spirit continue through her diary, and they speak a truth far more powerful than any of Stalin's or Hitler's soldiers. They're all gone. Her words remain. Her spirit remains. And even though John may have died never knowing how important his role was in creating Christianity, that first generation of Christians that gave us the Bible, they said this about him. He is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That poor guy was in a cell. He didn't understand the purpose of his life. He thought, how can God make a difference? And yet through him, that first generation of Christians said, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Were that all flesh? Just think about that. He's sitting in a cell in Jerusalem. He doesn't think anything is possible. We are halfway around the world. We are 2,000 years later. We're still talking about that John who died maybe in hopelessness because God was still able to work through him. We are that all flesh. Even though John may never have realized the importance of his life, he's part of the reason why we are here today. And I find a great deal of satisfaction and hope in John's story. And for that matter, also the story of that Jewish girl. And I hope that you can too in the season of Advent, because sometimes the ways of the world seem immovable. Sometimes it seems that we have to march down a predetermined path, no matter how much we fight going down that path. There just seems to be no way to stop, no way to turn around, that it seems that we have to keep going along this path that we don't want to march on. And sometimes it feels like we're trapped, that the powers that be, we are trapped. So John, that whole message in the meaning of Advent, it says that doesn't have to be true. That even when hopelessness fills our lives, when we think about all of the things that we have to fight against as Christians, as people of virtue and morality, John's example is that there is not hopelessness, that we are a people of hope. And today, on top of that candle of hope, we lit that candle of peace. You know, talk about unlikely, talk about naive, talk about silly. Peace? Really? I mean, there is so much violence, there is so much war. You know, you don't even have to go far. We've had murders in the little town of Hatfield. We've got wars and preparations for wars every single day. Our world is filled with violence. So how in the world can we as Christians really have anything more than a fairy tale hope and peace? How can peace ever be possible? Well, one way that we're going to be confronted by the tragedy of war and constant violence is if we don't think that peace has got any kind of a chance. Then we've given up on peace, and then violence wins by default. If we think that peace is only a fairy tale, violence wins by default. When I was reading that young Jewish girl's diary, there was the scary, there was the depressing, but there was also, in her words, the boys that she had crushes on, the snowball fights at school, the memories of spring, the memories of her family. She and a girlfriend promised each other that regardless of whether or not they were still friends, that in 10 years, on March 16, 1950, they would come together and meet again. She didn't make it, but there was that hope that in 10 years we'll meet again. So I think most every one of us, I bet a full 99% of the world, if not more, that all of us remember and dream dreams such as this. But somehow, war and violence the tiny little people, the, the majority, you know, the tiny little percentage of people that, that wants war and violence, we don't want war, but we don't think peace is possible. That doesn't make any sense to me. We don't want war, but we don't think peace is possible. And Advent comes along as this wonderful season of hope and anticipation. With Christmas approaching, we're allowed at least for a short amount of time to dream dreams like a child to believe in all things possible like a child, to imagine, to even imagine all people living life in peace 
And as that song continues, you may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. John Lennon, who they shot outside of his apartment in New York, thought that religions were part of the problem, that religion was a reason for war. But this song has somehow become a part of our Christmas repertoire. It speaks a message that is not all that different than that of a child savior born for peace for all people, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He thought war was partly, or religion was partly responsible for war, but we've taken his message and we celebrate it at Christmas. We sing it at Christmas. So let's believe in John the Baptist's example that God can be working through us against immovable powers and that even if we don't realize it and that even if we don't see it in our days that what we do for peace today will somehow make a difference someday and somehow so that the world may really somehow not as a fairy tale we may actually live as one so may that light of the advent wreath growing ever brighter in this season let's pray and work for peace in our world not as a fairy tale, but as a hope. And may this be our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And in that same spirit of peace, let us sing, let there be peace on earth, um, number 677 in our blue hymn. So let us hold the gift of peace in our hearts 
and let us pray for peace in this our only world. Let us weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, and let us go forth and carry Christ's peace, peace with us always, so that all flesh may really see God's salvation.